Cyberpunk 2077 is finally here, which means it's time to build a Cyberpunk themed gaming PC build that doesn't break the bank. Let's do this. As always, I'm going to run you through all the parts I selected and why today, before booting this machine up to see how it performs in a wide range of titles, but most importantly, Cyberpunk 2077. I'm going to run you through RTX on and off, DLSS on and off, and really see what settings you can fiddle with, with a machine like this that really doesn't break the bank. Let's kick things off though by installing the CPU, the motherboard and the RAM all nicely together. Now, kicking things off with the motherboard, as I say, this is from MSI, and it's their B550 Tomahawk board. It's got all the B550 features that you've come to love and expect, with plenty of RAM, M.2, and PCIe expandability. Most importantly, though, it supports our CPU choice today, AMD's new Ryzen 5 5600X out of the box. In terms of Cyberpunk performance, with 6 cores and 12 threads, and some really high boost clock speeds, it's a great CPU choice today. It's a bit on the pricey side but just about fits uh, into the budget of our system. It should also help if you want to do a bit of streaming or video editing, although much of that kind of workload is now GPU bound, but we'll come on to that a little bit later. Installing the CPU is pretty easy, you guys know this, we're just going to pull that arm up, drop the CPU in and drop the arm back down. It brings me nicely on to the RAM today, this is a 16 gigabyte kit of Thermaltake's Tough RAM RGB. It looks great and at 3600 megahertz, it's the perfect speed today. 32 gigs is a bit overkill, especially for a gaming build and doesn't really fit into the kind of tighter budget today. I really wanted to see if we can play Cyberpunk with all those epic RTX settings at a price point that doesn't scream, I'm not the average gamer. Right, installing our RAM's pretty simple. We're gonna line the notch up as always and the RAM's gonna click into place. Remember, this notch goes to this notch on the motherboard, and in our scenario, we've got the Thermaltake logos located at the top of the motherboard, with our RAM looking nice and pretty. With that now installed, all that really leaves us to do is install our M.2 SSD today, and for this, we're gonna need the teeny tiny little screwdriver. Look at this. The teeny tiny screwdriver fan base is indeed growing. Now we're just gonna use this to remove our M.2. <laughs> I can't believe that. Our M.2 slot today. MSI include this handy little heatsink, and this is going to help to keep our M.2 drive nice and cool. It's, believe it or not, they can get a little bit toasty. Specifically, this is the Seagate Barracuda 510. It's a fantastic, great value oriented M.2 drive, and it isn't going to get too warm today, but the heatsink is certainly going to help us out. You just want to remove the pre installed M.2 standoff screw, and we're going to use that same screw today to just drop the drive nicely into place. Simply pop back on your M.2 heatsink, a little something like this today, and just like that, our M.2 drive is now installed, and with that, the motherboard assembly is indeed complete. Okay then, it's now time to move the motherboard assembly, as we're gonna call it, into our case today. I used this chassis actually not all that long ago in a video you can find in the card section up here. But I was that impressed with it. I didn't get, not got shocked. Ah! <laughs> Did you hear that? That was absolutely monumental cricket. <laughs> Ow! It's got shocked again. Static electricity aside though, you guys seem to like it too. It's Antex DF600 Flux, and is a case that is quite literally crammed with airflow. We've got vents at the front, we've got vents on our power supply, we've got plenty of ventilation at the top, we've got even more ventilation on the rear side panel with fan mounting options, and perhaps most importantly today, a price point that really doesn't break the bank. In order to install the motherboard, into the case, we just need to check. How was that? Ooh, bloody hell. Noises aside, that under each of the holes on our motherboard today, we've got a corresponding standoff installed in the case. And that means we need one here, 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 and 
here and we're all good today. The motherboard is then just going to slide into the case with the rear IO shield coming through this cutout at the rear. And once we've got that in, we can just go and screw that motherboard down through the nine here's, I mean nine holes, that I pointed out a second ago. Alrighty then, the motherboard is now in our case today and we could install the power supply, but no, 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 no. We'll do the CPU call out first off. I'm quite excited about this. It's a Cooler Master ML120R. It's got an addressable RGB fan and pump, but I have actually picked up on the other side some extra RGB fans from Antec so we can have this in kind of a push-pull config and keep our temperatures nice and low today. This is also a pretty good value call out which I think makes it a great choice for something like a 5600X and a 3060 Ti build on the slightly higher end of things. Now much like a few other coolers, when it comes to AMD installation, it's super simple. You just use these included brackets which hook over the pre-installed mounting hardware that you find on any AM4 motherboard with any Ryzen CPU. Before we do that though, we're just gonna clamp this to the rear of our case in a push-pull configuration, and that's gonna make sure we've got plenty of air pressure to not only suck the hot air out the case, but bring cool enough air through the radiator today. The build aesthetically then is starting to really come together, which means it's finally time to install the graphics card before we round off with our power supply and a bit of cable management. The GPU though today is the NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3060 Ti. Specifically, this is the Founders Edition card. It's one of, if not my favourite, 3060 Ti design. Yes, availability is a bit mm, even more so with the Founders than some of the great AIB cards we've tested in this playlist here, but it's a fantastic choice for our build today. It gives you a lot of legs at 1080p in terms of high and ultra settings, and also some legs at 1440p. You probably can game a bit at 4K on this card and we have tried it to some success, but for today's build, 1080 and a bit of 1440p is the focus. When we use NVIDIA's DLSS technology today, which combines AI and machine learning with upscaling for a frame rate upside, with of course RTX and ray tracing to give us that vast visual improvement, especially in a game like Cyberpunk where reflections and light and neon are kind of the impetus of the whole title, we're gonna see a really fantastic game experience today and if you hadn't noticed yet we've also got some fancy cyberpunk wall art which i will link in the description below i did buy this myself to kind of celebrate the launch of the title today let's get this founders edition out the box though you can see this card's a bit more silver than say the 3070 card that we've looked at as well gunmetal gray might have worked better for today's build but this is still a fantastic looking card that runs pretty cool and has all this really solid metal which provides a really really great processor underneath with a really solid build quality on the exterior. Handily, the second and third PCIe slots have already been removed, which means a pushback of our retention clip and the graphics card is gonna slide into place with not really too many problems at all. We can then clamp down this cover at the rear, pop our PCIe power connector in today, and then all that's really left to do is power this machine up to see how it looks, but more importantly, exactly how it performs. It's also worth mentioning our power supply choice today. If you'd like to see a fully detailed breakdown and guide of how to install all the individual cables mentioned today, head to this video in the cards now and head to the timestamp on screen. This is from Antex though, it's their Earthwatts Gold Pro White with some really nice black individually rubber sleeved cables, it's perfect for today's build. And the 80 plus gold certification with 750 watts of headroom is also great. These RTX cards like nice clean power and this ticks all those boxes. All that's left to do though is install this, do a bit of cable management and then boot this machine up to see just how good it looks and then of course how it performs in not only silent punk but a load of titles today without any further ado though roll that montage Okay then, now you've seen just how good this system looks when it's all powered up and we've gone through and put it together, let's see how it performs. I'm going to jump into my usual range of gaming benchmarks a little bit later, but first let's find out what the best Cyberpunk 2077 settings are to get that all important 60 
frames a second. Off the bat, the game looks pretty insane driving down this ramp through the Night City. It's kind of crazy. And if we see here in our settings menu today, we are actually running at 1440p, so we're pushing the boat out uh, already. 4K is obviously not something you're going to do on a roughly $1,000 system. And then if we jump into the graphics menu, we've basically got everything on the high preset today. But what we're also going to then do is turn ray tracing on, uh, set the ray trace light into ultra, make sure all of our RTX effects are enabled. And then of course, pop DLSS on auto. This is NVIDIA's fancy AI driven effects that basically render the game out at a slightly low resolution, use AI and millions of hours of research to upscale it back up, giving you that frame rate upside and also uh, that visual fidelity you'd expect. So you can see here, we're hovering at 1440p at around about the 50, 60 FPS mark. Obviously the more light we kind of encounter, the more demanding it's gonna be on our system today. And we are of course gonna skip time and head into the e evening and actually test this game at night where those reflections are that bit stronger. Let's actually see what impact first of all we have by turning DLSS off. There we go, pop DLSS off, close out of that before we test that 1080p. And whoa, it's a slideshow. <laughs> this is a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> oh my God, I've been shot at and I can't even, I can't even see where from. We're at 20 FPS without DLSS. That's a bit scary. I mean, that's kind of crazy, right? I know what you're thinking, James. You're playing at 1440p. Most people with a system like this are gaming at 1080p high frame rates. So let's drop it down to 1080p first of all. Hit apply. There we go. And we're going to going to keep DLSS off and ray tracing on so we can kind of see what upside we get. That's taken us to about 42 FPS, which is, let's be honest, is still not very good, but that is with DLSS disabled and that had a huge performance hit last time around. So let's go back into our settings. Let's actually go down and set DLSS to auto. This is going to make sure you get that kind of best possible DLSS image quality and doesn't push things in the frame rate department too far. There we go. And that's bringing us a bit closer to that 60 FPS mark. There's the 62, 65. Let's see if we move a bit more. Oh my God, there's light everywhere around here. I'm just, um, this car's going to explode. That is an, obviously a much, much better gaming experience. Visually, the game looks pretty fantastic uh, once again. One thing that we've seen from our testing though about Cyberpunk 2077 is that it's incredibly CPU bound. Even here, our CPU is boosting up to its maximum 4.6 gigahertz speed. And that basically means the reliance and the bottleneck with this game is on the CPU. That's not to say you should go and buy a Ryzen 7 or a Ryzen 9 for this PC. The 5600X is great. And overclocking, it's probably gonna give you a bit more frame rate as well. One thing we have definitely seen though, is that without DLSS and ray tracing enabled, this game is incredibly difficult to run. And as you'll see from some of the on-screen comparisons with RTX on and RTX off, Without ray tracing, this game is a whole different beast. I mean, if you look at the reflections and the shadows and the neon, if any game is primed for ray tracing, it is Cyberpunk 2077. We'll also pop on your screen now some side-by-side -side comparisons of DLSS on versus off, and not from a frame rate perspective, just standing still to kind of see the image quality impact. And at auto on the DLSS settings, it's actually much more minimal than you might think, and well worth it in my opinion for that frame rate upside. It's not just Cyberpunk 2077 though that this system excels at. Let's jump in next up to control and see how that and all of our other games today Day fair on this 3060 Ti system. At 1440p medium to high settings with DLSS enabled at 960p and ray tracing on medium, you're looking 90, 81 and 70 frames per second for those average 90 and 99th percentile results, which are the metrics I've used across the board in today's build video. Death Stranding is next up, 1440p high with DLSS once again enabled, but this time on the quality preset, gives you 138, 122 and 118 FPS respectively. The inbuilt benchmarking mode in GTA 5 is my next test today and means you can go and compare this system against all my previous builds super easily. 106 on average with 97 for the 90th and 87 for the 99th percentile results are a pretty impressive showing. Apex Legends at 1440p high settings is once again pretty impressive, 149 FPS on average, 123 and 121 for the 90 and 99th percentile results. And that is with the frame rate set to unlimited in the origin kind of command line. Call of Duty's Warzone is next up, the first COD on my list today before we test the new Black Ops Cold War 
and at 1440p high with of course no ray tracing or DLSS supported in the Warzone mode, only in the story mode, you look in 130 FPS on average with 92 and 87 for the 90 and 99th percentile results. Call of Duty's Black Ops Cold War story mode then, not the zombies just yet at 1440p high settings with both reflex and ray tracing enabled uh, in this instance and you look in 80, 66 and 60 FPS for those average 90 and 99th percentile results. Forza Horizon 4 is a pretty easy and increasingly less popular game to run but it's a really consistent test in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. 4K Ultra settings gives you 98, 93 and 88 for the average 90 and 99th percentile FPS results, which is pretty dandy if you ask me. Overwatch is next today then, 1440p Ultra settings gives you 155 FPS on average with 140 and 134 for those 90 and 99th percentile results. CSGO then today at 1440p high, trying to kind of tone that resolution down to give you guys those real esports caliber frame rates. And here you're looking 304 FPS, which is kind of crazy. Battlefield 5 then is next today, 1080p high settings with RTX on and DLSS on, gives you 82, 71, and 65 for the average 90 and 99th percentile results. You get the drill by now. And of course, the 1080p resolution, the area that most people are probably going to be playing with a system like this. Minecraft RTX, the beta is next up. It has just come out of beta, but that doesn't really affect the frame rates too much. And we filmed this video a week ago. 1440p with RTX on and a render distance of eight chunks. Currently the only recommended level in Minecraft RTX gives you 97, 94 and 90 FPS for the average 90 and 99th percentile results. Doom Eternal then is next today. We're motoring through these games like nobody's business. 1440p Ultra Night Nightmare, what a preset name, 161, 145, and 136. No ray tracing or DLSS here, but the game is a superb test of all in all general rasterization, an area that AMD's new cards, for example, have done pretty well in. Rainbow Six Siege is next today. The game's inbuilt benchmarking mode at 1440p Ultra gives us 165, 150, and 139 FPS, and was a really enjoyable gaming experience. Valorant is next, 1440p high settings with NVIDIA's lag-busting reflex technology enabled, which streamlines the GPU processing pipeline to basically help to reduce input lag. And here you're looking 229, 197, and 183 FPS. Reflex is pretty useful, but combined with super high frame rates is kind of the optimal way to run a competitive title. Watch Dogs Legions then is the penultimate game today. We're motoring through these, as I said a second ago, 1440p, very high settings, RTX on, DLSS on, gives us that frame rate upside, and you're looking 78, 72, and 69 FPS. And the game looked great, tested in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. We love an inbuilt benchmarking mode here at the GeekerWatt channel. Fortnite then is finally uh, the last game today. We tested it at two different settings variations. First at 1440p high settings with RTX on, and this was given us 61, 52, and 46, which I know you Fortnite fans, that's not very high. So we've got a solution. We're gonna turn off RTX, stay at that high 1440p resolution, and then turn DLSS on. On. This is going to give us 221 frames per second, 194 and 172 for the average, the 90 and 99th percentile frame rates. And this has given us not only a competitive, but an esports level gaming experience, leveraging, of course, NVIDIA's latest DLSS tech technology. With that being said, though, I'm kind of going mad we've gone through that many games today, and that not only wraps it up for the gaming benchmarks, but the video as a whole. Let me know if you enjoyed this video, something a little bit different. Thank you to NVIDIA for sponsoring this one and making it all possible. Let me know if you were playing Cyberpunk in the comments section down below. Thank you very much for watching, though, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.